So what I want to do today is I want to talk about epilepsy from my vantage point as a neuropsychologist. Part of the problem with that is you don't know what that is, and that's okay. Most of my family actually doesn't know what it is either. And so uh, what I'd like to do today is, is let you know a little bit about what, what I do, and I'd like to uh, just kind of take you on a tour of children's brains and teen brains and also looking at just the whole idea of the impact of experience on the formation of the brain. And I want to offer you guys a challenge as caregivers or parents to engage as an active participant in your child's brain development in the midst of having a seizure disorder. Now, what is a neuropsychologist? <laughs> it's a great question. Well, my background, just so you know a little bit, is really is I'm a clinical psychologist by trade. And in Canada, I'm a Canadian. At the time that I was coming through, uh, there was no postdoctoral training in, clinical, uh, in, in pediatric neuropsychology, so we all had to go to the States. That's changed since. There's a couple now in Canada, but I went down to Atlanta, which was a, I don't know who, if anybody here has ever been in Atlanta. Anybody here ever been in, in Atlanta? The food was incredible. The experience was wonderful. But what I got to learn in those two years after being a clinical psychologist is what's the link between the brain and everyday behavior? When you have a seizure disorder, what does that mean in day-to-day -day life, emotions, behavior, academics? Is there any way that we can connect the two together? And so I worked with a number of children with medical, emotional, behavioral, and developmental problems to be able to look at some of those domains of development. And um, I consult with parents, educators, and physicians as far as the progress of those children in the midst of a seizure disorder. And as has been read, I've been involved with some research. Um, I think it's a fascinating job that I have. I think I have the best job in the world because kids are so resilient, aren't they? And so what happens often when I get called in, just to kind of make it more understandable, is when you are working with a child, or when your child has a problem, let's say they're having problems at school, their memory, we've noticed since seizures have started that maybe their language has regressed. I find them to be very moody lately, and boy, that behavior is, is a problem. We have some conduct concerns now in the midst of this. When you say that to a neurologist, what they will often do is refer them to me because as a neurologist works with kind of the physiology of the brain and the EEGs and the MRIs and overseeing the medications, the so what of that in day-to-day -day life is something that we work in tandem with a neurologist with. I think it's a great pleasure to do that. So people come and see me and I spend a lot of time with kids. Often uh, if, if you're you know, five or six or over, I'm spending about five hours with your child we do a number of different kinds of tests, looking at intelligence and memory, attention, executive function, motor. And we kind of then boil it all down, hopefully, into a report that makes sense to you as far as what's the so what of that seizure disorder for your child in day-to-day -day life and learning and, and enjoyment. And we have a plan that we, we, we hopefully will, will we use at the very end of that so you can kind of know, now what do we do? What's plan A? What's plan B? What's plan C? So I've got a question I'd like to ask you guys all here to begin with. And the question that I'd like to ask you is, is my child's brain set in stone? Is his or her brain hardwired, period? Or better said maybe, in the midst of a neurological disorder like a seizure disorder, can I assist my child's brain development? Now, this is a picture of Jackson. What will, what will Jackson be when he gets older? Will he be a good student? Will he be funny? Will he play sports? Will he have friends? Will he be social? What's he going to do? Scientists now believe that the answer to some of those questions, in part, to a large part, go beyond just genetics now. Now, my wife and I kind of kid about this. This is my son. Well, <laughs> I'm six foot four. And I play basketball. My wife is five foot one, and she plays the piano. Sometimes I think there's a lot of bitter tall women that are wondering why us tall guys are with the short girls. But we have a daughter who's quite tall, and he's not as tall. And so we, 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 we kind of think about that as we look at the interplay between genetics, but then we look at the interplay of what my wife and I do with our lives and, and what we model in front of them. And what science is starting to show now, and what we're really fully understanding, hopefully better and better as time goes on, is that we are not just a sum total of that. But actually, that over there has a huge impact 
on what your child is going to do when they get older. Now, I'm not going to pull uh, a uh, biology 101 on you, but there is some things, oops, there is some things that are good for you to know as far as the brain. Now, the basic unit of the electrical system that we call the brain is a brain cell or a neuron. And the neuron is composed, you can see there's a tall kind of cable-like structure in the middle called an axon. It has branches at the ends called dendrites. And that's like a root system that receives information from the multitudes of other brain cells. Now, if two brain cells or neurons are wired together, then an electrical current or charge is allowed to pass from one axon to the next. This is the way the brain communicates. Now, ultimately, these neurons form vast neural circuits, being a branch of interconnected uh, brain cells that influence each other and can work together. Now, some circuits output, I mean, it's, it's all for an output, isn't it? So we hope that this is going to lead somewhere with these circuits. Well, some of these circuits are involved in such things as regulating your child's heart or their temperature. But some of the circuits that we have in our brain are even then involved, of course, with learning and memory. How do you do a math problem, et cetera? And we're starting to realize that these are very important. Well, we've realized it for a while, but these are very important in day-to-day -day living and functioning. Now, when a baby arrives in the world, the baby has over 100 billion brain cells. Each of these brain cells has a number of different possibilities for connections with other brain cells, other neurons. And really, there is the possibility, a possibility of over one quadrillion connections. But it's all not driven just by genetics. We, when the baby arrives, what research suggests is maybe about 17% of, of those connections between brain cells and neural connections are made. But then the rest of those get made over the next days and weeks and months and years. And now we know even decades, and that is part and parcel of your experience that helps to make that. Now, I think a picture that drives home the impact of experience is this. Each of us, if you think back, maybe we didn't grow up like this, but we had the hands of different people in our lives that no matter what our background was, whether it was advantage or disadvantage, impacted who you became as an adult. I would suggest in this picture, the ante is up to even more so that it's the experience of this child. It's not the genetics of this child, whether their parents were physicists or anything, but because of life circumstances, now outside forces are coming in that are really having a huge impact, hopefully on the way that this child grows up. That's the power of experience. So we're back to the original question here, the original slide. The impact of being hardwired by your genetics and experience being softwired. And the different experiences that we have can help the brain develop in different ways. It's good for you to know that. It is this plasticity of the brain, its ability to develop and to change in response to the demands of the environment that will enable a child to better learn. What sort of things are we learning nowadays? Well, isn't it amazing how your kids know how to use electronic things and iPods and you have no clue? <laughs> isn't it amazing that most of us here probably have microwaves that are flashing 12, right? <laughs> right? We're lost. My son Jackson can turn on and off a computer and he just turned three. But my mother can't do that. Isn't that an interesting thing? And so we, much like our predecessors, are so dependent on the experience to be able to learn, to be able to form those neural connections. And just like today we're using computers, our ancestors' days gone by and needed the same sort of thing, to make butter or to do the, the fields. This is one of my heroes. <laughs> I always wish I had hair like him, but, but <laughs> times haven't changed. We're still dependent on experience. Now, I want to use an example for you guys, just to, you're adults, just to be able to look at how experience impacts your brains. And I'm going to use uh, an example from Dr. Jennifer Raymond, who teaches at Stanford U University. I think it's, it's pretty powerful. That's not her. <laughs> but isn't it amazing? I don't know if, how many of you guys have gone to your 10, 20, 25, 30, and plus classroom reunions. 
And, and you see the face of someone who looks really familiar, but for the life of you, you cannot remember their name. You ever had that experience where you're in the supermarket or something and you see somebody, it's like, I know them, uh, but, but sounds like, looks like, and you're trying to figure it out, but you don't know. Well, have you ever wondered what's going on here that really impacts whether you remember or not? I lose things continually. My keys, my wallet. I don't have a bad memory, but something's going on. My wife is still trying to figure out that in me. And I, the science is really tr also trying to help us to understand what exactly changes in the brain when you learn and how these changes persist over a lifetime. One thing we know is that learning is not a unitary process. It's not just a one sort of thing that we can localize and isolate. There's no one single mechanism of learning in the brain. Instead, there are distinct regions of learning that depend on distinct brain regions. So let me take you on a little tour. There's the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is a brain structure that supports memory for facts and events in your life. This is what helps you to remember what you had for breakfast this morning. Then we have the amygdala. The amygdala supports emotional memory. You can have a fear of dogs, even if you've lost the explicit hippocampal memory of having been bitten by a dog as a child. So that memory system continues. When you see a dog, you get a startle, even though you can't remember that. This is why my mother showed me the movie Jaws when I was in grade six, I think. And for years after that, going in the lake scared the tar out of me. My mom even tells me, I don't remember, but I started wearing my bathing suit into the bathtub. I don't know what that really meant for protection, but it impacted me so much. And I'll tell you something, even to this day, I had a friend say, do you want to learn scuba diving? No. <laughs> I have no desire. I'll climb trees, walls, anything, but I'm not getting in the water with a shark. People in Australia grow up, and I've had Australian friends say, you go camping. That's so strange, because there's bears around. Well, I don't think twice about bears, but I wouldn't go surfing. Isn't it funny how whatever you grew up with in that experience shapes what you're willing to do or to not to do? Well, that's tapping into maybe some emotional memory for you. The basal ganglia supports habit memory. That's, where, that, that's what, is what you're using when you brush your teeth, when your mind is somewhere else. The cerebral cortex supports perceptual learning. And the one that just clicked off there is the cerebellum, which supports motor learning. That's a process by which you acquire skilled movements. Now, all of these dots, if we were to zoom to each of these brain regions, we would find that we are made up of the same building blocks, the same neurons and, and brain cells, which are specialized cells of the nervous system, really the building blocks of the nervous system and how the brain communicates within itself, communicating electrically and chemically one neuron to the next. And the very connections between these neurons are not only important for processing and functioning, but these connections are known to change with experience or the lack thereof. Let me give you an example. This is you. Let's say you're driving down the road and you see a yellow light. Well, that input will activate brain cells in the visual parts of your brain. And when they're activated, they will send signals to the brain cells in which they have connections. And a typical neuron has connections with thousands of other neurons. Now, if some of those neurons get enough input, then they too will get activated and send a message on to the next neuron and then a signal to the next neuron and then the next neuron. It's kind of like that body on tap commercial. Remember your friends and your, you had your friends and the, you, know, you know that commercial, anybody? It's that same idea. Your neurons communicate one to another, boom, boom, boom. And ultimately, the output, when you see that yellow light, would be to eventually have an output that's generated by movement of your foot to the... Ah, see, your experience affected your motor response. I say the gas pedal. <laughs> now, some of you are nodding, and some of you guys are like, uh-uh, you're frowning a little bit. But to those of you that are frowning, never fear, never fear, because experience has a way to impact 
my neural circuits and those that reach for the gas pedal. So, for example, <laughs> enter the police car. Now, if you get a ticket for running a red light, this is likely to induce changes in your brain. Now, some connections between neurons might get stronger, others could get weaker. And this will cause the circuit of neurons to process information differently next time you see a yellow light. <laughs> That's the idea. So back to children. What we do know, or what we need to know about the experience is that it really does impact our, our children's brain's development. And in the very first couple of years are extremely important for this. They're extremely important. And just looking at the time, I'm just going to, there's things that go on where not only are circuits made, but when you don't use something, there's an, there's an activity that's called pruning that goes on. And that can be a good thing. It actually increases the efficiency of the brain. But sometimes when you don't have experiences, when you're supposed to have experiences, <laughs> things will prune that you shouldn't have given up to begin with. Now look at this slide here. This is a great example of how the environment can impact you, right? Everybody ever all been there? Well, the thing is, is at that young age, what we do know is that there's windows of opportunity for brain development. And when the connections between the brain cells are right to develop and connect, and when you're genetically saying, let's connect, let's go neurons, it's so great when the environment comes along with that and meets with that and helps bring that neural development along. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. We have examples of that all the time. One example of a missed window of opportunity is sight. The neural connections between a child's eye and the brain have a significant development in the first year of life. That's the window of opportunity. This is such a big issue that if a child was to be born and have congenital cataracts, we now know to remove those in the first year because otherwise the experience that they would be missing impacts how sight is developing in that child. And then the window closes. So we remove it. Another great example that we're all familiar with in the popular, uh, popular media, but also sometimes in our own families as we adopt, is the impact of having the need for attachment after you've been born. And when you are in a, an, an orphanage, that when you, cr I don't know if you've ever done this, but if, uh, if you walk into an orphanage, sometimes they're fantastic. But there's other ones sometimes where you walk in and, and the children, the babies, are all quiet. You think, oh, look at that. They're all quiet. The reason why they're all quiet isn't because of a positive thing, but it's the impact of the, the, the environment on them, that when they've cried and when they've reached out, nobody has come to meet them. And so they have just learned over time to extinguish that behavior, and they no longer will do that. And we, we miss some critical times of attachment emotionally and socially in the first couple of years of life. And I have friends that have adopted four-year-olds, two-year-olds from different nations, and, and they're trying to reconnect the circuitry. They're trying to reestablish some sort of connection in the brain to have the capacity to have relationship and meaningfully and not indiscriminately. Now, language acquisition is another great example of, I'm sure you all know that you don't have to tell a child to make noise. They just do that. But whatever language you're brought up in, one of the over 6,500 languages of this world really will impact even how the brain develops. When an infant is three months old, the infant's brain can distinguish several hundred different spoken sounds, many more than are present in one's native language. Over the next several months, however, the brain of that infant will organize itself more efficiently so that it only recognizes these spoken sounds that are part of the language that they're hearing. So if you had a one-year-old Japanese baby, they may not recognize that la is different than ra because the former sound is never used in this language. It also kind of highlights why you don't want to have ongoing chronic ear infections during the first year because so, there's something that's going on cortically in the experience of, and these children, when you're exposed to all different kinds of sounds and of people, and it's not just TV, folks. It's not just little Einstein and putting in a video. But what research has shown, it's the meaningful talk. It's the give and take of language 
that helps a child not only discriminate sounds so they can become, as they get older, even better readers and have that sound, but you take that away and we're missing a window of opportunity. So we want to read to our kids when they're young. We want to spend a lot of time conversing with our children when they're young. Another window of opportunity is adolescence. And now what we know is that the frontal lobes are still developing, even into our early 20s. The frontal lobes are involved for executive function, and the executive function would be those kind of higher cognitive abilities that you would have to be able to plan, to organize, to regulate your emotions, regulate your behaviors, to initiate problem solving, to plan problem solving. This is what you do with your executive function. What's interesting is that at the, around the time of puberty, about age 11 for girls and age 12 for boys, there's a growth spurt in the frontal lobes. We have a lot of gray matter coming up. And it's a very good opportune time to allow kids to start using their executive function, to take more responsibility for planning and organizing. Instead of us being their executive function, start to get them to be their executive function, and that helps the, the neural circuitry of the frontal lobes. It's a very important time. You know, it's interesting, I look at this picture, and I, I, as a neuropsychologist, I work with brain injury too. And <laughs> I can't watch those YouTube videos, right? I don't know if you guys can, I can't. Uh, but what's interesting is these same guys that are doing this at age 15 and 16, when your frontal lobes are still developing into your early 20s, they're not doing that anymore. You know why? Because they're thinking about consequences. You're not really thinking about consequences when you're that age. Unless your name's Tony Hawk. And you can give me a call, Tony. But there, there are adults that still do it, but it's usually not for the same reason. Now, take home messages. What I'd like to do with you guys in the remaining time is I would like to put on my neuropsychologist hat and invite you to come and sit around the table with me. And these are some of the take home messages that I often give to parents in the sense of wanting to try to accentuate how experience in your role as a caregiver can impact and give them the benefit of developing as much as they can in their brain. Sometimes genetically, we do have limitations and that is true. And it's very sad. And what I mean by that is that in some respects, when children are born with certain sorts of anomalies in the brain, there are some limitations to how much they can do. So I'm not suggesting to you now that these are miracle things that are going to go beyond the realm of genetics. However, what I would just, and this is a, a loose heuristic for me, is I think genetics sometimes can set the high bar, but the experience shows how much we can live therein. And when we bump up the volume for our kids, to allow them to develop better, I think we can get them more to their potential, no matter what their brain formation is. That's really what it's about, about being better at what you can do. So here's some of the take home messages that I share with people. Multisensory, multisensory learning. You know, remember back to that learning, the tactile, the, the motor, the, the, the list learning kind of verbal, the more that you can connect some of those dots together when you're teaching them. This is why Montessori has really been a really neat, there's some, some, been some studies coming out in the Montessori approach and tracking with these kids and it's amazing what they can do. It's not the only way, but they really tap into the multi-sensory sort of approach to education. Tactile, visual, learning. It's like when you remember when you were learning fractions, you cut that apple. That is a great way. But can you tap in their emotions? Can you tap in anything else? Well, that's a good question. After early infancy, I think this is where I'd like to pick up with that question, learning plasticity is modulated as a function of attention, brightness, judgment of error, punishment, reward, and motivation. Let me give you a little bit more neuroanatomy, but hang in there. It's, I hope it's not boring, but it'll make sense, because that's really what I want this to be. I don't learn things that I don't pay attention to, okay? Going back to what drives my wife crazy about me, and some of you have sat in my office, I've told you this, because I use this all the time. I lose my keys religiously. I've gone to the mall, and I've had it happen twice, where I've parked my car. I lived in Edmonton, in West Edmonton Mall. I came out, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I called a cab to get home. Because I could not find my car. Now, 
you might say, that's really a lousy story to tell me when you're assessing my kid, because you've got a bad memory. <laughs> but the, the issue is, I'm juggling, and you guys are going to relate to this, I'm juggling all sorts of things with my attention. I'm looking here, there, there, there. I'm thinking about the different hats I wear in life. Dad, neuropsychologist, neighbor, attend a church. I do all these different things, all these different roles. Neighbor, husband. And sometimes in the midst of that, my attention is all over the place. Do I have a bad memory? No. Actually, I don't. But I just need all of the clutter out so I can attend to this one thing. Right? At home, lower that attentional interference noise of your kids. Turn off the radio. Turn off the TV. Let your kids get a good rest. I've got a lot of kids that are tired coming in to see me. They have TVs in their room and they're watching it. And then they're trying to get to sleep and they wonder why, we wonder why they have problems falling asleep. Well, well, even before I go on, let me tell you this. You know, let me tell you about a few things I think are important. When I'm testing kids, you have, like going back to what I said, you have to be attentive when you're learning. There's a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is really the attentional neurotransmitter in your brain. It's the arousal neurotransmitter. I use this. Now, do you know what? When you wake up, that acety acetylcholine, it increases. It takes about four hours to reach to your maximum, where your attention is as good as it gets. That's why some of you that get up early and go to work and wonder why you drool for a while at the beginning <laughs> and search the internet and look at the news and all those different kinds of things, I would suggest you're probably <laughs> below the four hour threshold, right? What I try to do when I have kids come in then when I'm testing them or when I'm teaching my own children is I raise their attention as much as I can. And I try to get them involved. I'm very animated. I have puppets, enthusiasm. I use my voice, joy, facial expression, because I want to engage them to arouse their attention because that's absolutely central to learning for children. Another neurotransmitter is, the, is norepinephrine. That's the aha neurotransmitter. And when you can teach things in a new and novel way, you ever get it when all of a sudden something makes sense and you go, ah, ha, ha. and it's almost like it's imprinted in your mind, you get it? That's what happens when you flood your memory with norepinephrine. Actually, that's why you remember also bad dreams and not your good dreams. When you have a horrible dream, norepinephrine floods your brain. You remember that. I never remember my good dreams, but I always remember my bad ones, especially about sharks. That's the whole idea. So you want to teach your kids in new and novel ways to draw them in. That it draws in their emotions. Dopamine. You don't learn what you don't want to learn. And dopamine is very central to motivation. And when you've got smaller children, this is incredibly important to help them to learn. Reward systems, punishment rewards, high five stars on charts, those sorts of things, that they start to get the idea that this is important and there's a reward to this because dopamine is like the save button of your memory. And when you're jacked up and excited and you're thinking that this is going to go somewhere as a young child and high fives and marbles in the dish or whatever reward system you use, you're increasing dopamine and that helps them to remember that better. That's why gambling works against you if you're a chronic gambler. Because as that reward comes and dopamine floods your brain, you remember this is a good feeling. Or if you're a runner, dopamine. So can you do that with your kids? Absolutely. Get motivated. Get creative. Be there with them emotionally and physically and cognitively and attentionally. And don't put them in front of a video. It's very tempting. We're in busy trying times. You know, I grew up in a family that was disadvantaged actually, which is kind of interesting. My wife and I were just talking about this. I grew up in Saskatoon, and my father had multiple sclerosis, so he wasn't able to work. So we were on the poverty line for years. So you know what my mom did? She got creative. You know what my mom did? She got me involved in group stuff and free things in the community, and she was making things and puppets and signing us up for everything free under the sun. And it really enriched us. I don't know if that's why I'm here today. But I really know that I have the handprint of my mom on me, no matter what my situation is. Some of you are single parents, some of you are here together. But we have different starting blocks in life, but it doesn't mean we're predestined. 
right? Now I have a predisposition. I can have a pre, I can have a knee-jerk reaction to something, but I'm not predestined. Thank you very much. And I think we got to put away the victim idea that that's then start to take responsibility as parents. And when I see parents do this, I see it enrich their children. And their children can get jazzed about school and life, no matter what is going on around them. That's what I mean by enrichment and deprivation. It's powerful at all ages. Early and intense interventions, if there's difficulties. The literature shows over and over for speech, for motor, early intensive intervention. Get going now, 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 now. Now can I get on my soapbox about something? I am so Canadian it hurts. I love Tim Hortons. I love hockey. I, the only thing that gets me, really, to get goosebumps in the back of my neck is donuts and hockey. It's retarded. But <laughs> what I would say is that when I come back here, when I was in Georgia, which is not the stellar state, folks, when they had children with epilepsy, and they needed speech, and when they needed physical, edu or, or physical uh, PT or OT, or they needed interventions, or they needed special help in the classroom, the federal government mandated that they got that, and the schools would do it. So you'd have one school, possibly with more than one speech and language therapist, one school with maybe more than one occupational therapist. I come back here, and I've been here back a year and a half now, almost two years, and I was at a speech and language conference here in Vancouver and somebody was saying, yeah, you need intense, on, ongoing individualized attention. And, and there was a laughter amongst the therapists. Because they're like, I'm one therapist covering three schools. Yeah. Well, the, what the literature shows is we need intensive, repeated, early intervention to help work at those neural circuit, circuit level to get the most of the, what we can. And we don't do that here. What's the answer to that? I'll get to that in a sec. If you've got concerns with, with your child's academics, get an evaluation. In British Columbia here, it's often recommended that people don't get evaluations academically until grade three within the school system. That is so against the learning disability literature, that is so against what is actually cutting edge when it comes to education, that we can identify dyslexia in grade one and two. We don't wait till grade three because we've missed two years of intensive opportunity for intervention. So if you have a sneaking suspicion, but your school is saying, oh, let's wait till grade three. If I had a little piece of advice for you, please get an evaluation and get that teased out. Because that experience, do you know when you have good Orton-Gillingham or some of the other different kinds of interventions for dyslexia, they've done brain imaging studies and looked at pre and post. It's absolutely amazing where on the left uh, the, the left hemisphere, we now have activation and fluency much quickly coming out, word recognition, word calling much quicker after the treatment because of the impact of experience on the brain. We don't want to miss those opportunities. Quickly, the other ones, if you're married, be a team. So glad to see the guys that are here. Build responsibility into your child, not just self-esteem. Identify the true enemy. The true enemy is not your child. Now you might say, of course I know that. I had, an, uh, I had a phone call from Atlanta actually uh, about three weekends ago and they were friends of a friend and their child had just been diagnosed with a seizure disorder. And it was a two-year-old. And what they, it was diagnosed with a, with a frontal lobe seizure, complex partial seizures in the frontal lobe. And the child was given two medications for seizures. And what was very interesting is that the, the parents wanted to take their child off of that because they, saw, they thought the side effects of that medication were inability to, to uh, it, it was a behavioral nightmare. And what happened was just in, over the phone, just talking to them about what frontal lobe seizures do, how that impacts your regulation of your behavior and emotions, the enemy was not the medication. Actually, the, the enemy was the seizures. Or it could be that one of the many telltale signs of a seizure disorder of having inattention or behavioral problems or as they get into adolescence, even mood issues and social issues and self-esteem issues, that we can come down hard on kids when maybe some of these things might be related to their medication 
Some of these things might be, might be related to their type of seizure disorder. Now, don't get me wrong. All of us can be lazy. All of us can use the system. <laughs> but there really is skulls and crossbones in some of these skills for some children because of those enemies, the seizure disorder. Do you understand what I'm saying? Or do you get what I hope? I'm trying to be pretty upfront with you. Good treatment is always based on good assessment. And don't be your child's executive function. I can't tell you the amount of times now where I have adolescents come in. It happens once in a while where the parents are over-functioning after puberty. And they're doing their children's assessments, or not assessments, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be really bad. But uh, they're, they're doing your projects and handing it in. And really, in essence, being kind of a virtual parent in the classroom. And that can't happen. You need to give, you need to be planning ahead of time, allowing them to be uh, de independent before they turn to age 18. The power of mentoring, boy, a lot of these I could just talk to you so much about. Power of mentoring, when, when you can start to get other adults that say the same things that you do, if you've ever had it where you're at your child's door and they don't open that door, and you pound on it, and the more you try, the less open they are, there's limits to even the best parent of how you can impact your kids because every one of us has our own will. Every one of us has our own uh, way of life. Other things, there's three dials to influence your children. One is you, and sometimes even if you turn it up, you get diminishing returns. The other one is their friends, and you can't choose them for your, but friends influence your children. But this one over here is mentoring. It's other adults or young students or college students that are backing up the same moral, ethical, life sorts of things as I say. And sometimes when that person just takes them out for a Coke once or twice a month. And that parent, I've had parents come back and say, you know, he said like his uncle was telling him this stuff. I've been saying that stuff for years. <laughs> but somehow hearing it from another adult had a huge impact on that child. Don't overload your child with programs. Here I am talking about experience, experience, experience. But I've also seen some parents who load up everything. So these children are doing something every night and they're so tired and they're not being children. And intimacy is really in the margins of our life, isn't it? Relationship, right? Anybody here like to read books that have the writing all the way to the edge of the book, all the way into the cover? No. We need to have some margin around it. And intimacy in life is in the margin of life. If I work 70 hours a week here, I've got no intimacy with my kids or with my wife. We need margin. You need margin. And the unification of the disgruntled, that's the last point. I would love to see a grassroots movement among parents here because one thing I hear from parents over and over is, I didn't have any central place to go to to really find out everything I needed to know once this hit our family. I didn't know about what to do with tax returns. Now this is the great thing is, is the great organization that has put this on today is a huge step towards people knowing what to do. And you need to be tapping into these sorts of things. But I mean even unification in the sense of what's going to bring change here? I don't think it's necessarily us as physicians or, or neuropsychologists, although we can add our voice. But there's something about parents unifying together, raising consciousness in the media and with their MLAs and the politicians that seems to get the attention of the power gate people. And down, I, here's why I'm so pro-Canadian, like I said, my arteries are American, to be quite honest, because I love the food down there. But I'm, but, down there, they would sue, they would march, they would do all sorts of things. And sometimes I just wish we were a, less little, a little bit less like the Switzerland of North America. When there's wait lists of a year and a half, and we just kind of go, yeah, but our taxes are higher. Taking home more of our money and less services than good old Georgia. I don't get it. I don't know how positive a, neg uh, a message that is for the hospital to hear or you to hear or whatever. I think it's a reality. We all know it. And the physicians here and the, and the people that are here, the social workers, are trying to do a, a, as good a job as they can. I just wish we, I know for neuropsychology, I wish there was more of us. But it takes money. And that's the sort of thing that we have to start going beyond just being unified and disgruntled, but to actually move that into a positive direction together. And that is the end of my talk with you today. Thanks very much.